Okay, fine. So, good morning, everybody. So, benvenuti to the last day, <laughs> already the last day of this course. And as you know, this morning we'll go to the main course of the study of spatial structures in ecology. That is, the methods we developed uh, in the lab since, uh, well, almost 20 years from, uh, since we began thinking about all this. So some something extremely interesting and who proved to be very effective at modeling spatial structures. Uh, and this at all scales. When I spent my postdoc year with Pierre in 1989, we were already thinking heavily about how to model spatial structures. And at that time, our tool was polynomial regression or, well, ordination, polynomial CCA. This is the thing we developed and we implemented within the variation partitioning procedure that we published uh, later in 92. And uh, that was actually the end result of that postdoc. But of course, we were aware that it was a very crude way of uh, modeling spatial structures. And we wanted something that could go deeper into the structure, and this at all possible scales. So during the following years, we tried just about every, everything reasonable. And it didn't work. So at last, we decided to do unreasonable things. And then, of course, it worked. Because I guess ordinary uh, reasonable things had only been, uh, already been uh, tested by other persons to no avail. And this led to what we call today distance based Morin's eigenvector maps. But this is already going ahead of myself. So, uh, just to mention uh, that uh, historically, the first version of what I'm going to present to you now is, uh, was at that time called Principal Coordinates of Neighbor Matrices, so PCNM. And that was the uh, 2002 paper. We developed this uh, from uh, 97 to uh, about that date. And then we published a second paper with applications in 2004, and that in ecology to popularize the method. And yet two, year, and, uh, two years later, we had that development, or in meanwhile, Pierre in, invited Stéphane Dre and also uh, Pedro Pérez Neto in the lab. And together, they developed or they precise the mathematical framework of, of all this. And Stefan, in particular, could demonstrate that what, what we had found empirically was, in fact, a particular case of a broader family of methods. And since then, we call this method MEM for Morin's eigenvector maps. So this is the story that Pierre and I are going to tell you this morning. I begin with uh, that the, these early stages. So, and of course, uh, going to the outcome that we now use every day. So we want to understand and model spatial or temporal community structures, because uh, time can be also modeled by this technique through the analysis of species assemblages, which are, as we understand now the best response variables available to estimate the impact of changes in ecosystems. So the spatial structures, Pierre already give you, gave you a talk yesterday to explain why or how they originate and why they are important. So I, I don't have to go here uh, on uh, this topic again. So now to understand 
the mechanism that generates those structures, we have to integrate those structures explicitly in our, into our statistical models. Scale is important because some processes act at a global scale, others are regional, others are very local, so uh, there's no reason why all species are structures at the same scales uh, or uh, the same way across all scales. And of course, we expect that uh, a response variable can be dr driven by processes acting at different scales. So we have to find out which of those processes reflect on the s spatial structures of the community at those different scales. So we need statistical methods to model spatial or temporal structures at all scales. So the main tool, the one we use most frequently, we call now distance-based Morin's eigenvector maps. And this is the tool that we formally call PCNM, Principal Coordinates of Neighbor Matrices. Actually, DBMEM, as we call them, are a slightly modified version of those first generation PCNM. So we have this data. We have a species data matrix. We have environmental data. And we have spatial data. At this point, let us simply consider their coordinates, geographical coordinates, x and y. So what are our goals? We want to model the spatial structures of the species data at all scales. We want to identify the scales where structures are present and significant in the response data. We want to decompose the spatial model into sub-models representing those scales that are important. And we want to interpret the submodels, meaning to reveal the uh, species environment relationships at those scales, at the scales of those significant submodels. And now I go to the unreasonable thing we did. We are thinking about, uh, so this is a general pattern. In the upper left corner, you have the response variables. In this case, I have put one single variable, but of course, we apply this to our data tables uh, through RDA uh, most of the time. So here you have data that are georeferenced, meaning you know exactly where the site, where the call, the, the, the sample uh, units have been taken. Compute a Euclidean distance. So these are the data. Compute a Euclidean distance among sites, among the geographical locations of your sites. So in this simple univariate case where you have one uh, transect, uh, this would lo look, uh, if it's equispaced, it would look like something like this, the, uh, the matrix of Euclidean distance. So, so this is the upper triangular, triangular matrix here. Well, you have a distance of one between uh, the sites that are closest to one another, uh, of two, or the second closest, and so on. And now the, a the idea was to say, well, what we, we first want is to identify the spatial structures at the first level, meaning closest. So for the closest neighbors, the nearest neighbors. Hence, the idea to truncate, to truncate this Euclidean distance matrix to retain only the first neighbor relationships. And this, after that, of course, you have to fill up your matrix with something. And after months of empirical trials, we found out that if we fill this matrix with values equal to four times the maximum value that was retained, meaning in this case, it would be four times one 
equal four. But in other cases, with irregular samplings or two-dimensional samplings and, uh, or any, anything you want, you, you simply truncate the matrix to uh, limit. And then you fill up your uh, distance matrix, your matrix of ge geographical distances, with four times that maximum value. Before I go ahead, be reassured you won't have to do this by hand. Of course, we have now functions that do that for you automatically. And uh, believe me, when I did the simulations for that, each of those trials, before I uh, put up the Fortran code at that time, it was Fortran code to run the real simulations, thousands of things, and so on, I had to go through, I don't exactly remem remember how many steps Impl uh, implying how many computer programs to be able just to do what I'm showing you now, to you now. I think it was something like uh, three to five different programs. So that I, have, I had to go back and forth and do this. Now we can do this even if you don't have the, the, uh, uh, the functions, the ready-made functions to do it. You could do it in a couple of lines of our code. But at that time, we didn't have R. Okay, so now we have a matrix that has been completely deformed. I mean, just the first neighbor relationships have been retained up to a certain distance. And everything else had been filled up with four times that maximum distance. This is a new matrix that is not at all Euclidean. And for, uh, of course, now since we had the information in the form we wanted, it, we could not resort to any square rooting or whatever. Any, anything, even square rooting that uh, doesn't make it uh, Euclidean and uh, no other possibility was available there. So, after that, we still have another step to go through to be able to use the result as the necessary spatial information needed for canonical analysis. And that step is principal coordinate analysis. And when you have a dissimilarity matrix and you want to have its components, then you run it through principal coordinate analysis. And this is what we did, obtaining, well, I'm here, uh, obtaining here, as expected, positive eigenvalues and one zero and a couple of negative eigenvalues. The first time we tried this, we were hoping to get some information about one specific scale of relationships among the sides, of spatial relationships, meaning the one uh, relating the closest neighbors to one another. But to our surprise and pleasure, we discovered that actually that way of treating our matrix produced the whole range of eigenvectors of different, it was a, we, we tried first with a, such kind of linear samplings to see what, what was going on. It's easy to uh, figure out, to, to visualize. And we had the surprise to find that this provided a whole range of sine waves going from the, from the broadest one to the finest one. And then, we said, yes, this time we have our spatial variables. These are much more uh, detailed and present at all scales than, and also orthogonal to one another, all characteristics that our good old polynomials did not have. And then, of course, we applied multiple regression or uh, RDA. Uh, CCA as well at that time. So what I've just explained now are the PCNM, so principal coordinates of neighbor matrices. Now you see why it is called that way. You have a matrix of neighboring relationships, so the distance among sides up to a certain limit and then everything else replaced by an arbitrarily large value. Why did we replace it by four times the largest value? Because it levels out. At that, 
uh, from if you only one time uh, simply repeated the largest, it gave some results, and twice the largest, it gave other results, and three times, four times, yet uh, uh, slightly different results. But from that point on, five or ten times gave the same results essentially. So uh, since it leveled out, we uh, stopped at this point. Uh, by the way, uh, a couple of years later, Stefan Ré also explained mathematically how it behaved li like that. In any case, this is not important here. Uh, but what we obtained here was extremely effective at extracting spatial structures from data. But it also presents some little problems, or maybe simply there are some features there that uh, have to be uh, mastered before uh, being very effective. One of the fe th those features being the large number of variables that are produced here. And uh, th these large numbers are one reason why we almost systematically resort to forward selection after uh, the building of the uh, DBMEM to uh, find out which of those are significantly related to our species data. If we didn't, we would have an overly large number of explanatory variables. And model overfitting is not our cup of tea, as you know. So what is the difference? To be uh, quick about this, because I won't uh, go very deep into the, the maths here. It's, it's not necessary. Uh, what is the difference between the original PCNM and what we now call DBMEM? It's actually quite technical. It concerns the value of the, on the diagonal. I didn't mention the diagonal here because it looks trivial. I mean, to, to, from our point of view, the diagonal of the matrix is uh, the distance between each site and itself, which should be zero. Okay. Now, during its um, years in, uh, in, uh, in Pierre's lab, Stéphane Dre showed that you could consider it uh, another way, well, he turned those to similarities instead of distances, and he replaced the diagonal, which was now similarity one, to, to, to have a measure with a, an upper and a lower bound. Instead of similarity one, he put similarity, similarity zero, as if each site had no uh, relationship to itself. Seems strange. And also, he had a slight modification in the way uh, I didn't. He didn't, I, I, he didn't, he doesn't make the Gower centering, uh, I think, or not in the usual way, as I remember correctly. Does, does he? I think, oh. Oh, the way is different, but the result is about the same, or yeah. something like that. There is a difference. Uh, okay, so, so, uh, because. Okay, so. Uh, oh, <laughs> didn't look up the math and the detail. Anyway, uh, as, uh, the main thing here is that using those slight tricks, he managed to obtain very slightly different things. Well, I, actually, they are completely the same. But the way they are scaled across the, the whole range, he can obtain instead, well, uh, we had positive, uh, we had, of course, the total number of positive, null, and uh, negative eigenvalue, well, uh, eigenvector with positive uh, null, null and negative eigenvalues uh, was n minus 1. Of course, this is not manageable. You, you, do know, you cannot run a regression with n minus 1 uh, explanatory variables. Of, uh, you get an R square of 1, as we explained already. But then, of course, uh, the one with uh, positive eigenvalues is less than that. For a transect, for the PCNM, the original PCNM, we got, uh, uh, for a transect of 100 points, we got 67 positive uh, eigenvectors, or eigenvectors with uh, positive eigenvalues. But we found out that some of them, uh, later, that some of them actually corresponded to the modeling of spatial structures with negative autocorrelation, negative spatial correlation. The way Stéphane Dre modified the computation has one great advantage. It makes the eigenvalues of all 
those eigenvectors, of all those PCNM, now DBMM, MEM, exactly proportional to their respective Morin's I, so the index of spatial correlation. Meaning that just from those eigenvalues, you see whether they model positive or negative autocorrelation. So actually, that corresponding to a decrease of the number of positive uh, eigenvectors or real eigenvectors because uh, of that property. Furthermore, I should have said uh, only uh, eigenvectors with positive eigenvalues and so on. Furthermore, all this is actually translated to, uh, to a situation where all eigenvectors are real. So we have real eigenvectors modeling uh, positive spatial correlation, and we have real eigenvectors uh, modeling negative eigenvectors. That was something very handy. And it's, uh, of course, easy in that case to separate the two bunches of eigenvectors. And now, in the case of a regular uh, equispace transect of 100 points, you would get about uh, 49 or 50 uh, eigenvectors modeling positive spatial correlation. So, to summarize their properties, DBMAM base functions, so eigenvectors, represent a spectral decomposition of the spatial relationship among the study sites. They can be computed for regular or irregular, irregularly spaced sets of points. The DBMEM base functions are orthogonal, or all orthogonal to one another. You know that. Principal coordinate analysis produces orthogonal uh, axes. So we don't have that problem that we had with uh, uh, polynomials, for instance. And if the sampling design is irregular, the DBMEM have also irregular shapes, not the, the beautiful sine wave or the patterns I show you in a couple of seconds, but they can still roughly be sorted into uh, scale from the broad, broadest to the finest scale. Since they are orthogonal to one another and representing various scales, they can be split into subgroups that can be put together to represent submodels of spatial scales, of various spatial scales. You could run a forward selection of uh, your species and uh, against all, say, the spatial, uh, the, the positive. Uh, to be short now, I'll speak of positive or negative DBMEMs, but this is short for uh, DBMEMs modeling positive or modeling negative spatial correlation, okay? So you could take the positive ones, which is what, you, you, what we usually do, run a forward selection, because you have a, a roughly n uh, divided by two for regular sampling designs, you have n uh, uh, over two of those, so this is way too much, too many. So you run a forward selection, and usually what appears after the forward selection, what is retained, is a couple of broad scale ones, maybe several. Uh, sometimes they are scattered all across uh, the spectrum, but in many situations you may have a couple of uh, really broad scale ones that come out, and then another group at uh, intermediate scales, and a couple of them scattered in the finer scales. This is the usual pattern. So it, in this case, it's relatively easy to fish out those that have been significantly extracted at the uh, highest level, so m meaning the, the, the broadest scale, and separate them. This, there is an arbitrary decision, of course, uh, to uh, decide where you split those. But you can do this and then uh, take uh, the same at the intermediate level uh, scale, spatial scale, and at the finest scale. They can also be computed for circular sampling design. 
there is an example in a paper that can be found on Pierre Legendre's web page uh, to do that, how to code uh, the, the, the sampling design itself before putting it into the uh, grinding machine of the DBM, DBMEM uh, production. DBMEM analysis can also be used to, for temporal analysis. Since you can apply this to a spatial transect, you can apply it for time as well. And I shall present you later to you later this morning uh, one way of applying it or one application where this property is useful to us. So this is how they look like for those DBMEM for a regularly spaced transect of 100 points. I have just plotted a couple of them here. So the, you, you have uh, the, the numbers. So this is the first, this is the second, fourth, eighth, 15, 20, 30, and 40. You see, uh, actually, here for those 100 points, we get 49 orthogonal DBMEM, uh, positive D DBMEM. So you see that really this captures the spatial structures or it has the potential to capture structures from the broadest scale to the finest one. I, my, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did you understand how uh, polynomial regression worked? It's the same principle, except that instead of polynomials, so getting one band and two bands and three bands, we have those. So it's exactly the same way. You mean you take them as explanatory <laughs> variables. And if, for instance, you have a structure in your data that has something very important or a trough. Of course, it can be reversed uh, through the, the sign of the canonical uh, coefficient. Uh, something that uh, contrasts two regions uh, in your transect, then it will be captured by this first one. And this will come out significant. If you have two bumps or a central trough or a central bump or whatever, it's very likely to be captured by this one and so on and so forth. So since you have really everything, of course, uh, I have only put a couple of them here. Uh, you have really all scales here. Uh, finding a combination of those two models, just about everything thing can be done, and we, we did it. I mean, if you uh, consult these papers, all of them, the ones I have uh, cited, of course, are available on Pierre Legendre's website. So you can download them anytime. So we really uh, tested this on uh, on a variety of, uh, of shapes, and those uh, DBMEMs uh, are able to capture just about everything to model uh, what you want. But then I was just heading at that before your question uh, arose. Um, it, actually, you can model even a linear, linear trend with those. It seems a little bit strange that you could model a linear trend using sine waves, but this is extremely cumbersome. You need half of them. It takes actually one out of two. Every second uh, DBMEM has to be <laughs> mobilized to model a single linear trend. So this is an obvious reason why you won't do that. that. What you have to do is first check if your uh, response data have a linear trend or not. And this can be done, of course, by simply running a regression or, well, an RDA of your response data explained by the X and Y coordinates. If this came, comes out significant, you remove the trend, meaning you take your response uh, variables, you run an LM, no, no need to go through, uh, through uh, the RDA function, uh, LM function uh, goes very well for that. You, take your, you, you run your LM model as your response variables, uh, tilde, x plus y, and you take the residuals. So resid, LM, and the model. It's that simple. 
So you, are, you get rid of this linear trend, and of course you can uh, use these uh, their, uh, full potential going uh, to uh, uh, trying to find out which spatial structures are uh, present in your data. For a regular square, two-dimensional central uh, uh, sampling design, those MEMs or DBMEMs give this. So DBMEMs, uh, I explained to you why these are called now uh, DBMEMs, because we are distance-based, meaning the truncation distance uh, of the uh, uh, geographic uh, distance matrix is based on distance and not simply on uh, links or whatever, uh, distances. And they are called Moran's eigenvector maps because their eigenvalues are proportional to Moran's i, to their Moran's i. Okay? So this is what it gives. So again, here, you have a possibility to model a trend. Combine, combining those two can, uh, can of course, uh, allow you, in this case, to model a vertical or horizontal trend uh, here. And uh, again, the, the, the two-dimensional equivalent of those sine waves I showed you in the previous slide here. So in this case, I have 400 points on uh, each of those maps, and I get a little less than 200 orthogonal DBMEM modeling spa uh, positive spatial correlation. Uh, in general cases, we restrict the analysis to the uh, positive DBMEM because it's rare that the negative ones allow us to find something interpretable. Meaning that, of course, if you have positive spatial correlation at short range and you have a gradient, you're likely to have negative spatial correlation at broad range, which would be the case here. But this is already captured by such, uh, 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 such a DBMEM. I mean, if you have this situation and indeed your community is contrasted between uh, that part and this part, then the first DBMEM will be highly significant, and you know that you have positive correlation at this range and negative at the broad one, because if you are here, you're likely to find a, a very different uh, uh, site when you are far away. So, actually, we don't use, except for very restricted situations where people find well, want to find particular things, uh, usually we restrict ourselves to the positive ones and we forward select these ones. So let's go to a real example now. Again, with my uh, oribatid mites from the lac -G. As you remember, these are 70 irregular, irregularly positioned uh, sites and 35 species. So how does it go? At this point, I don't speak of uh, environmental variables, as you, as you notice. This is a strictly spatial one. Okay? This is the next generation after the uh, trend surface analysis based on polynomials. Well, so I construct the DBM variables. And in this case, I got 22 with positive spatial correlation. Well, you'll see 22 with a 70 side. This is not the half of them. It's less than a third. Yes, because this sampling site is, uh, the, the sampling design is irregular. You get this. So we get more, actually more negative than positive ones. But this is not, not important because those, those 22 are plenty enough to capture many spatial structures. And uh, we run the global analysis and then we forward selected the uh, variables. And we got eight significant DBMEM should be a semicolon, actually, between global and eight significant DBMEM. Uh, we, get, we got eight significant DBMEM variables. And we could, well, as I told you, this is an arbitrary decision where you separate them. But you partition those by scales, so the DBMEM 1, 3, and 4, which were significant, the second one was not, uh, represented what we call the, uh, the broad scale. DBMEM 6, 7, 10, and 11, the intermediate one, the medium scale. And then we had that DBMEM number 20, 
just alone uh, in its corner modeling fine scale structures that came out significant and this one was considered as a representative of fine scale structures and we separate the DBM MEM analysis by scale so we run after that we can run separate RDAs using these three groups all the code for this analysis for you to replicate it is in the practicals in two days practicals so you you will be able to do this by yourself so this first figure here actually represents the DBMEMs themselves so this is not the analysis of the oribatid mites it's simply the spatial variables equivalent to those uh, carpet like uh, structures I showed you uh, two slides earlier okay so this is what I obtained for the oribatid mites so this is strictly, uh, these are our tools, okay? Our explanatory variables. So the, see, as you see, the first one contrasts two groups of sites here, up here, the black ones, and uh, here still uh, in the upper half of the transect, the large white ones. And uh, the rest of them down there have very uh, values very close to zero. Yes, to interpret this, it simply means that you have uh, uh, large positive values uh, in black and, uh, well, positive values in black, negatives in white, or the reverse, I don't remember, this is unimportant. And as a Swiss, I tend to see the black uh, values as the down uh, and the uh, <laughs> negative, and uh, the, 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 the white values as, uh, as positive because I usually see the snow in the cap of the mountains and not down in the valleys, you see? <laughs> you get my point? Okay, so this is unimportant, as you know, uh, the, the signs are arbitrary. So, okay, though, so we have one that clearly contrasts two regions here. Uh, the number three seems to contrast something here laterally between those two regions. Again, nothing very important in this uh, lower part of the, of the mm -hmm. transect. But here, you, you get something, uh, a tool, a significant DBMEM modeling, a contrast here in, in this region. But after that, you see that why we decided that those three modeled uh, broad-scale spatial structure by contrast of the next uh, to the next ones, uh, here you see that you have already finer uh, structures potentially being identified at, at scales a little bit finer than the previous ones. So we decided that uh, those three together could uh, be the, our uh, tools for modeling the broad scale structures here. So uh, <coughs> 6, 7, 10, 11, you see you have progressively finer uh, DBMEMs, so with the potential to bring out some structures at intermediate scales and DBMEM20, which is uh, one of the last ones, as you see, uh, you are at a really local scale, contrasting uh, pairs or triplets of points in, uh, in regions like this, for instance, or so. So this is really something that could bring out some particular feature at that scale if, it's, uh, um, if it is possible. And now, if I, uh, for before going into the partitioning into, uh, into the separate scales, which I, uh, I shall uh, leave to you uh, to do in the, uh, also in the, in the practicals, uh, here is a DBMEM analysis using the whole bunch of eight, the whole group of eight significant DBMEM. So uh, this is, well, Multi-scale, yes, but all, uh, all the features in the same analysis. And I got three significant uh, RDA axes. So the first one here contrasting those two regions with respect to the other ones. These are probably a little bit dry. These are the driest, and there is something happening here also uh, concerning water or the lack of it, while the rest of it is more uh, wet weather. And, well, as you see here, the second one contrasts the central zones with respect to uh, both here. These are flatter, and uh, we have more uh, hummocks here and, and, uh, and shrubs here and here, so this may, may be related to that. And, the th again, here a third axis with uh, alternating uh, patches here. 
Now, of course, if you want to interpret this in terms of environmental variables, you just have to take the fitted side scores of, uh, of these axes separately, the first axis, for instance, and regress it on the environmental variables to see which ones uh, explain these structures seen on the first axis. And you do the same with the second, and, uh, et cetera, until, uh, well, for all those significant axes. So in this case, especially, well, or in, in those cases, it's very interesting to run those RDAs and test the axis separately to see how far you can go and hence how many axes you can interpret after that in terms of environmental variables. Yes? Okay. What I was saying is that the tools, the DBMEMs themselves, meaning the spatial variables, which have been built by principal coordinates of neighbor matrices, those are number one, three, four, uh, et cetera, six, six, seven, uh, ten. But now what I have done is that I have taken these eight significant DBMEMs and I have, uh, the, these have been constructed, uh, those tools have been, those DBMEMs have been constructed without the intervention of the oribatid mice. But then I, uh, I forward selected them and I obtained those eight, so one, three, four, and so on. Okay? So these are not my, uh, not the axes, the ordination axes of the mice, but the tools I shall use as explanatory variables. So now I have run the RDA using those as my X matrix with the aribatid mites as my Y matrix, uh, Hellinger transform, and I got those three. So the first three axi uh, RDA axes are significant. Yes, Pierre, you had a, a remark. It really comes from yeah. the fact that the label there is on the screen that says by DBMEM123. Oh, this is a mistake. This, is, this should... This should read uh, RDA one, uh, one, two, and three. You are fully right. I shall correct this and put a new, uh, a new version. Wah! Of course. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. So this is my fault. Definitely. Mm -hmm. No. This is uh, RDA axis one, two, and three. Okay. Uh, well, yes. I had detrended the mite uh, data beforehand because there was indeed. Uh, uh, a linear trend present, uh, so uh, I did as you, as I uh, uh, recommended you to do. This is what I obtained, and now I have nothing to correct here because nothing is written, <laughs> but I may just as well add it. So this is RDA 1 and 2 of uh, another RDA run this time only with the three uh, DBMENs modeling broad scale spatial structures. Okay, so we are coarser here. We just focus on those broad scale spatial structures. And I get those two models here that again I can regress, so the fitted side scores regress on the environmental variables to see what they explain. There are details about this in the in the book as well, of course. Although I think in the book they are still uh, done with uh, the first generation PCM, but it doesn't make a lot of difference. And uh, this is again uh, uh, another. So this time we are really we have separated the scale. So this is broad spatial scale. This is intermediate spatial scale, meaning I have run the, the RDA using uh, only the four. DBMEMs uh, of uh, intermediate scale, so 6 to 11, those uh, that are significant in this group, here to uh, use. And again, here I have obtained two significant RDA axes. So this is the result. And again, I could regress this on the environmental variables to explain those structures to see uh, what are the, uh, the, the forces, the environmental forcing that determines it. And maybe I find them and maybe I won't. And this would be the occasion to think about what could have generated a part of these structures if my uh, environmental variables did not. Uh, maybe I have missed a couple of them, which is very possible in this case, or maybe other processes may have generated some of these structures. And actually, I don't show you the result of the 
finest scale analysis because it appeared when you isolated that 20th variable from the rest of them, you get a non-significant result. Uh, this happens sometimes. So actually, you have some kind of a, uh, an effect of the, the fact that you have common, uh, commonly used a couple of variables, some uh, facilitated by the presence of the others. And obviously, this is what happened with, uh, with that one. OK, so see practicals for the interpretation. Uh, because everything, the material is there. You just have to go through it to my, uh, my script, my today's script of practicals to see that. Now, this still may seem a little bit complicated for people who four days ago had never heard of anything like the, uh, the stuff we are explaining to you. Fortunately, I have a heart. And I think. I, 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 I have a consideration for users. And so the idea came in my mind to program a thing that, uh, a function that first, uh, what first called quick PCNM, and that I have now reprogrammed a couple of uh, weeks ago to become a quick, D, a quick MEM. I didn't put the DB because I, it's beginning to make too many letters. So quick MEM. So with at the price of one single uh, command, R command, a uh, kind of uh, result, uh, quick MEM, uh, let's say, might dot H, just to remind you that it has been Hellinger transformed, and might dot XY for the XY coordinates. You do this, and you wait. <laughs> and you don't wait for a long time at that, because my function does this. You have it. So uh, for people who want to see how it is programmed, it's very transparent. You see all the steps. First, it takes the data, and it tests if there is a, a significant trend. If it finds one, it detrends the data, and it goes on. After that, it computes the DBMEM eigenfunctions and retains those with positive Morin's eye, so positive spatial correlation. It first runs and tests an RDA of the species with, with all the DBMEM, and it tests it. If it's not significant, OK, it stops there. It means that you have no spatial, significant spatial structure in your data, so no need to continue. It stops there uh, with, a, with a message. If it is significant, it continues. It runs a forward selection of the DBMEM with the Blanchet et al. Uh, uh, at co-authors double stopping criterion. So it takes the adjusted R square of the global um, of the global RDA that has been obtained here. Uh, it, it has uh, memorized uh, the R square, the, 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 the adjusted R square. And of course, the double stopping criteria is uh, the second uh, or the usual one it is the alpha level of rejection. So it runs it automatically. When it has selected some variables, it runs a new RDA with the DBM, uh, with the significant DBMEM. And it, it tests the RDA with those ones. And specifically, it tests the axes to see how many of those axes are significant. And point seven, it draws the maps, like the ones I showed you. It draws them automatically and presents them to you. And the output object here, this one, contains all the results. So you have the detailed results of the RDAs. You have the details of the forward selection and uh, everything and uh, the whole thing. Again, the only thing to do for you is this. Isn't that cute? <laughs> so it's just, there are just two things it doesn't do. The first one is splitting. Uh, the significant DBMEM into some models, because this implies an arbitrary decision that you have to make. So you have to go to the detailed results if you want to do this, and you see that uh, these and these 
Well, it, it gives already a couple of results on screen, I mean. But on top of that, all the results are in the object. But uh, for the rest of it, you have, if you want to split your significant DBMEM into some models, you have to do it by hand and then rerun the RDAs because, of course, the DBMEMs themselves are here. Actually, there are even two objects containing them, one con containing the complete set of DBMEMs in case you would use, it, uh, use them in another uh, situation for the same uh, set of sites, and another subset of them, the, one, the subset of uh, DBMEMs that are significant, I have already put in another, uh, uh, in another object, so you don't even have to uh, go through the process of sorting them out a second time, it's already done for you. And the second thing it doesn't do is uh, get a coffee for you. So unfortunately, I didn't find the command. OK, I will work with this, uh, the, uh, this PowerPoint presentation for which you have the PDF. And I will start with slide number 35, because the, the first uh, 34 slides uh, our presentation of what Daniel just uh, presented in some other way with uh, some other examples. So if you want to see other examples, there are at least three example data sets that are treated in my first 34 slides. But I will start the story uh, at, the, at this point where Stéphane Dre was in our lab. Yes, that's the picture of Stéphane Dre. As you know, he is now uh, the researcher in charge of ADE4, ADE GNET, ADE Graphics, ADE Spatial in uh, Lyon. <clears throat> but uh, then when he was in uh, our lab, as uh, Daniel has described, uh, I asked him to look into the, the method that we then called PCNM analysis and tried to put it in a, a formal mathematical framework. And then uh, he played with the former PCNMs in all sorts of ways. And one day, he called us and drew something on the blackboard of the lab. And he said, when you take the geographic distance matrix and you truncate it, actually, you are dealing with two types of information. So this idea that he had was central to what I'm going to show you. He said, first, you have the connections uh, between the sites, the connections that you want to keep, and those that you discard. Okay? So you can uh, see this matrix. This is a site-by-site -site matrix. Uh, it, <coughs> and uh, it has a diagonal, of course. And you can write it with ones for sites that are connected. For instance, when you keep the first distance class, you keep a one between the sites that are at the first distance class. And you put zeros for sites that you want to disconnect, those that are at some distance larger than the distance you have chosen for truncation. So here you have zeros and one giving you this connection scheme. Then the other information that we are using in distance-based MEM is some weighting, and in, that ca in, in the case that uh, Daniel presented, the weighting is the distances themselves. So he said, we have these two types of information, and maybe we could play the game differently. In some cases, we could use only the connections, not the distance. And in other, other cases, we can multiply this matrix by that one, with the distances, or we could replace the distances by some other weighting of the relationships between sites. It doesn't have to be geographic distance. And then we sat back and said, wow, he has opened the gate. He has opened the method to all sorts of other inputs, including everything that landscape ecologists and landscape geneticists are doing, that is, to use uh, the the difficulties of communication between sites for different types of organisms in here instead of distance. So uh, this was this great contribution that he explained in five minutes. Uh, but it is a uh, key development. Yeah, the next thing, uh, th and this is what uh, Daniel explained, in the old PCNMs, if you consider distances, then we 
had the zeros on the, on the diagonal uh, to indicate that the site, uh, site was connected to itself. And uh, the, uh, Stefan found that in the calculation of coralograms that uh, Daniel explained yesterday with uh, Moran's I spatial autocorrelation coefficient, you consider that the site is not connected to itself. So he said, let's do the same thing here. Let us put four times the truncation distance on the diagonal instead of zeros. So, but this is what Daniel has already explained. It was the other great development. So in terms of the different possibilities that are now open to us, thanks to this division in uh, two matrices, and by the way, this sign here is the Adamar product. It means the cell by cell product of that to that. If you have distances in this matrix, and here you have zeros and one, when you have a one here, you keep the distance. When you have a zero between two sides, the, <coughs> the distance becomes zero. It, is, it evaporates, it is truncated. Okay? So that's the effect of a Hadamard product. So he said, in binary MEM, we will only use this. And this is the method that had already been described by a specialist of uh, statistical geography, Daniel Griffith, in the geographic literature, uh, published at the same time as w when we published the MEM. Since he published it in 2001. At that time, our paper was already in press. So we did not copy on Griffith. It was just simultaneous findings. But Griffith was only interested in using binary connections, while we were interested in having the distances intervene in the calculation. So to obtain the DBMEMs that Daniel described, matrix A contains distances in addition to the connections. Now, we can also replace matrix A there by some function of the distances. And in the 2006 paper that uh, <coughs> Stéphane Dery published, he showed ways of transforming the distances and investigating a series of transformations. They are exponents of the distances that can be in investigated in an automatic way thanks to some functions that he made available. And so you can try all sorts of exponents of the distances and find out which one gives us the MEMs that produce the highest higher square when you do an RDA against the uh, ecological data, okay? So that's the trick to say that the best transformation of the distances before or multiplication with this and production of the MEMs, the best one is the one that produces the best model of the data, that is the, the, the model with the best adjusted R square. So he has functions that do that automatically. And then he said we can also replace matrix A by other weights, other types of weights, for instance, resistance of the landscape as usually done by landscape ecologists. So, yeah? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, because we use only half of it. Uh, we, if it was not symmetric, then the... Uh, Principal coordinates of, uh, obtained from a non-symmetric matrix would not be orthogonal. I'm not saying it is not possible to compute them. It is possible to compute them, but you will lose the orthogonality. Uh, there are other ways of handling non-symmetric matrices. One of them is to separate the non-symmetric matrix into two new matrices. One is the, the asymmetric matrix made symmetric by taking the average of the two sides. So this would be the symmetric component. And uh, the, uh, another component is the anti-symmetric component, which is a, a, a new uh, <coughs> symmetric matrix made with the difference between the two sides, the two sides of the asymmetric matrix. And uh, we have investigated that a little bit uh, for ordination, for instance. And uh, <coughs> these two components, you can try them separately to do two separate uh, MEM models. That would be the way I would recommend uh, to handle non-symmetric matrices, distance matrices. 
And indeed, resistance made, uh, to the, in the landscape can be asymmetric when you have a physical process, uh, for instance, uh, currents in the sea. But then for these, for these physical processes that create asymmetry, there is another method that is, I believe, more efficient than MEM, and I'm going to talk about that right now. Okay. Uh, so, yes, the, now we have all these four solutions instead of only DBMEMs. And in the new AD spatial package, there is an MEM function separate from the DBMEM function that allows you to do these other combinations uh, to the price of greater, a, a bit more complexity. You don't have a quick MEM function. Uh, well, the quick MEM uh, that uh, Daniel uh, produced is for DBMEM only. OK, now here came Guillaume Blanchet. And this is the asymmetric method that I was just talking about. Uh, during his stay in our lab, uh, he did a master's in our lab. And during that master's, he developed the double criterion for forward selection, and he developed the AEM. We told him, we can give you a PhD for that. He said, no, 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 I want to go to Alberta and do my PhD there with Fang Yanghe. So he said, master is fine. <laughs> but he did more than most PhDs <laughs> in the master's. OK, so I worked, uh, I worked with him on this problem, of course. Uh, of developing asymmetric eigenvector maps, that is, uh, <clears throat> modern eigenvectors designed to model processes, uh, to model the effect of physical processes that create an asymmetry in the, in the data. For instance, the difficulty of going from point A to point B going downstream is not the same as going from point B to point A upstream. Okay. Can easily realize that. And this applies to all kinds of processes. Uh, we, our applications up to now have been in water currents and things like that, but it can also be applied to transport in the air for uh, people who are doing atmospheric science. It can be used to model transport of pollen in the air or of any other. Any other uh, <clears throat> Thing of interest to you. So uh, again, with uh, Guillaume, we spent two years trying uh, everything in the book. And then we realized that uh, the, uh, we already knew the solution from the study of uh, <coughs> the evolution of genes. <coughs> Actually, we used a, a method of coding for a gene tree that we were already using for, uh, to model uh, the uh, river network. We had used that in a paper in 1996 or something like that. And we realized that we had everything, almost everything that we needed to produce more eigenvectors for asymmetric processes. So I will explain this example, and you will see that it generalizes to all sorts of in, any kind of asymmetric process. Here, imagine that you have a river network and that you study uh, what does the network explain the difference in the fish composition that you find in lakes that are in these four boxes, the, uh, one, uh, five, uh, uh, six boxes. Uh, these are rectang rectangular lakes for convenience of the schematic representation. And this is the river network. And uh, we were inspired for this example by the fact that we live in a recently glaciated area. Uh, 10,000 years ago uh, in Montreal, there were two kilometers of ice on top of us. So, you know, the, the, the rivers that we have now are rec have recently appeared after the ice melted. And of course, uh, 10,000 years ago, if there was any fish there, it was frozen fish like in the supermarkets nowadays, but there was no swimming fish. And the fish that we find in our lakes have recently gone there, and they came back from uh, glacial refugia, which were farther south. They were, the fish were in the Mississippi refugium or the Hudson River refugium, and they came back uh, as the, the ice melted. 
So we had this idea in mind of fish going up rivers rather recently to recolonize the lakes that were newly reformed. OK, so how can we model that? We said we have two types of information about the network instead of geographic coordinates as in the DBMEM approach. Here the information is about uh, nodes and edges. It is a graph from graph theory where you have points that are the nodes and links between the points that are the edges. And they are directional links because if fish go up the river, they go from there to there. We don't care if they go back down. We are interested in those that go up. And they can only go up following the, uh, the rivers that separate the lakes, either the, the rivers that presently exist, or in one study, we uh, used uh, the connections between uh, lakes that existed in the past during the, uh, sto the history of post-glacial formation of the lakes. <clears throat> Geomorphologists can tell us, oh, there has been a connection here that's not there anymore. So we can add it to our graph. Uh, anyway, the fish must have gone through these uh, rivers, either existing now or uh, historical uh, that existed in history. So we said, how are we going to code that? We use the system of coding that has been used in uh, phylogenetic analysis for 35 or 40 years to, uh, uh, to represent how a gene evolved into alleles. That's what we used. And it, can, it is done by this matrix here, where the rows are the points, the nodes, and the columns are the, the arrows. And we are uh, interested, as in phylogenetic, in, the, in, in directional links, that is in arrows. And we will, see, we will say, the, that for e each node here, either the lakes that are nodes and boxes or these nodes here, can be modeled by the series of arrows that connect them to the origin. Okay? So, uh, for instance, uh, lake number N8 here, the lake, this, this lake, the fifth lake, is connected to the origin by edge number two number five, number eight. So for a lake number eight, we have a one in edge at, at the bottom of edge number two, number five, and number eight. In the same way, uh, node number one is only connected by edge number one to the origin, so there is only a one there, and so on. So uh, we, uh, we had already used that in this paper in 1990-something uh, in an, an RDA or, at that time. The, uh, the important step that we had not thought about was to do a, a principal component analysis of that or a principal coordinate analysis of the distance metrics obtained from that. But now we knew from the... Uh, DBMEM construction, that we have to go through a distance matrix, get the eigenvectors, and these are representing the various scales. We said, let's try that with this matrix, but it is even more simple because we can simply do a principal component analysis of that. So PCA, and another method of calculation to obtain the PCA, and you, you may remember that PCA is first calculation of a matrix of covariance, then Eigen, eigenvalues, eigenvectors. But you can obtain the exact same result by doing another type of decomposition that I did not describe in this course, that is called singular value decomposition. So this is what we currently do for, uh, in uh, our program when we produce AEMs. We do SVD of that matrix, and it produces all the eigenvectors we need immediately. And uh, there is a diagonal matrix containing uh, the squares of the eigenvalues. Okay, so it is very easy to compute it. Or we could compute the distance matrix here, a Euclidean distance of that, and do principal coordinate analysis, and we would again obtain the same thing. So three different methods of calculation to obtain the uh, asymmetric eigenvector maps. And I will now show you 
that these things, <coughs> these eigenvectors, they, they represent the different scale. And of course, after we have constructed them, we will use them to analyze the response data in exactly the same way as Daniel described. That is, we may uh, <coughs> uh, take all those that model positive spatial correlation and use them together in an RDA model. We can uh, compute the uh, adjusted R square of the full model and then do forward selection using this, the first adjusted R square as ceiling in the selection of the AMs. Uh, we can then obtain the R square, uh, yeah, this adjusted R square for submodels after cut, dividing the retained AEMs into submodels. We can produce maps and so on. And we do exactly all the things that we were described before. But this is well designed for to study the results of asymmetric physical processes. Now I'll show you the AEMs obtained for this network here. This is my uh, exemplary network. Here they are. So <coughs> I drew the AEMs as shades of gray uh, on the network of the river system. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so this uh, gray here would be uh, zero value. Let's say that, well, following uh, the uh, uh, Swiss mountain uh, paradigm, this would be a uh, high positive value, the top of a mountain, white. And this would be uh, deep in a valley, black, okay? negative values. So we see that AEM number one divides the network into a left node with positive values and the right hand node with negative values, right? So you see the asymmetry immediately in the process uh, originating from node zero that has the value zero. AEM number two will work only in this branch, in the left hand branch, dividing again between this branch with positive value and this branch with negative values. <coughs> Everything here is near zero. AEM number three will do the opposite. It <coughs> forgets about the left-hand branch and divides this one into positive and negative. <coughs> uh, actually, the values may very well, when they are produced, the axes may have reversed sign. As we discussed before, it happens uh, by chance. Uh, well, by the chance of the algorithm and the way the algorithm is interpreted by your specific computer. I may obtain, with the same R function, I may obtain, uh, let's say, <coughs> positive values there and negative values there on a Mac, and on a PC you would obtain the opposite with the same code. So th it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, we have seen this one. In this one, what do we do? Uh, the differentiation is along that branch here. Instead of having, uh, <coughs> let's see, uh, slightly negative to zero to positive, we have from strongly negative to, <coughs> to positive here in this left-hand branch. Uh, here it is slightly different, and here it is in the right-hand branch. So we have finer and finer <coughs> processes that are modeled by these successive AEM. And <coughs> with this, uh, this number of uh, objects, we have eight objects plus the origin. We, uh, we obtain in total seven AEMs. And the first ones have, uh, correspond to a positive Moran's eye, and the last ones correspond to negative Moran's eye, meaning negative spatial correlation. That translates in the fact that you have <coughs> black uh, circles that are next to white circles. This is negative correlation. Opposite things are neighbors in this model, while here you have a smooth gradient along the two branches. OK, so it seems to work. I will show you uh, only one example, I think. Well, I may show you a, another example. But this is the example that we put into the, the original paper describing the AEM method. 
uh, we're talking about 42 lakes in the reserve in Quebec, north of the St. Lawrence River. And uh, what was the interest here was the diet composition of the, uh, <coughs> of the brook trout, Salvelinus fontinalis, in these lakes. So we looked at the stomach content of the brook trout. I remember explaining this to uh, an assembly of statisticians. And they would not understand why we would uh, look at the diet and how we would do that. So I told them, we uh, catch trout, and then we ask the trout, what did you eat today? <laughs> and the trout refused to answer. So uh, we had to open the trout, take the stomach, and look at what is inside. And the statistician said, wash. <laughs> but this is what biologists do. OK. <clears throat> so uh, you will see the reason in a moment. We wanted, uh, there, there was actually, a hypothesis that the trouts that successively reinvaded this river network after the glaciation came in successive waves and they may have belonged to different genetic groups and that different groups went in different parts of the network and we wanted to test that and the opposite idea was that fishermen may have carried <coughs> small trout that they caught in one lake uh, and used as bait and then they went to another lake and uh, threw them in the lake at the end. So transferred the genetic stocks from lake to lake and obliterated the, that signal. So we will see <coughs> how it comes out. This is a schematic of the said river network. St. Lawrence River is something somewhere at the bottom there. And the, the, the trouts may, that we find now in the lakes that are the dots, they uh, all came through this route. And at each intersection, uh, some group of trout may have decided to go left, and another group may have decided to go right, depending on water levels, the smell that uh, uh, came with the water coming from there or from there that attracted them, and so on. So trouts have their own ways of deciding if they go left or right when they go up in a river like that. Same thing in the sea. OK, so the, the, all the black dots are the lakes from which trout had been caught. And we coded this network. Uh, we coded it by hand, <coughs> with uh, the rows being the, the lakes and uh, the columns being the edges like this. Uh, we had the choice, oh yes, I did not mention that, uh, here, you can add weights, if you want, to these zeros and ones. If you think that the distance is important and relevant, you can multiply each of these, uh, of these columns by the distance that it represents. But in the case of these fish, we said, well, if the segment is half a kilometer long or two kilometers long, for a trout, it doesn't matter. Even I can swim a kilometer. So imagine a trout. <coughs> so, it, so in this example, we, did, we coded uh, the edges only with zeros and one because we thought that distances were irrelevant. What was important was that at each intersection, the trout has to make a decision going left or right every time it met an intersection. And so some of them ended up in the group of lakes, while others ended up in other groups of lakes. So we uh, studied this in different ways. If you're interested, you can look at the paper for more detail here. I'm giving you a brief summary, because we'll have coffee pretty soon. So question was, is the diet variation related to the genetics of the populations of trout that successively invaded the river network after the last glaciation? Uh, the, it, oh, uh, the metrics that has the nodes, the lakes as rows, and the edges, uh, the arrows in columns is called matrix E in our software and in the paper. And it is constructed with 42 nodes and 65 edges. Uh, we didn't use weights uh, corresponding to distances. Uh, everything is in that paper, table two. Uh, the, the results that I'm going to show you in summary here, because we tried all sorts of uh, ways of doing the calculation. 
uh, we compared, in particular, the AEM method that I just described to distance-based MEM, distance-based corresponding to the distance between the lakes in the network. And for instance, this lake is very close to that one. But along the network, it is very far, because this lake is in this branch, while that lake is in that other branch. So this is a good situation because of the folding of the river network to where we should have a clear signature of whether it is the network that is important or the geographic distance whereby fishermen may have carried trout. I mean, going to fish in this lake in the morning, taking small trout, carrying them there in the afternoon after they have a, their picnic. This is a short distance. So this is why we compared the two uh, models, AEM against distance-based MEM as the crow fly, I mean, uh, uh, distance, uh, direct geographic distance between the lakes. Here, the AEM model had an adjusted R square of 0.64, pretty good model, while the MEM had an adjusted R square of 0.20. Who wins? Okay. So we concluded that the trout genetic variation among lake is better explained by the AEM model than by the uh, direct distance model. Uh, <coughs> but of course, since this was significant, and even uh, when we did variation partitioning between the two uh, groups of uh, Moran eigenvectors, uh, we saw that even the fraction C corresponding to this fraction was significant in a partial RDA. And we saw that a, a small portion of the variation was non-directional, was significantly explained by this. Wait. It is an unfair comparison, yeah. Did you compare the AEM results with one obtained by the EMEM, but following the results? No, we did not do that one, no. The, <coughs> but we were comparing two different hypotheses of, uh, of the processes by which these fish happen to be there, yes. Uh, well, it's more complicated. Uh, these lakes are pretty similar, but uh, some of these trouts are pelagic, and others are benthic, and others are intermediate. This is what changes the diet. <coughs> they eat either plankton or invertebrates in the bottom, or a mixture. And uh, yes, I did not go in detail to the various elements of diet, but uh, I suppose you all looked at that. These are different things that trouts can eat but depending on where they feed, they eat different things. So that was uh, basically the idea. OK, so you can look at this, uh, at this paper, look at the example, and criticize it as, as much as you want. It is only an, an example of the way the, uh, the method is used, and that was our first published example in Oikologia. I have other examples here. Uh, uh, it, there was a second paper published with uh, three examples uh, coming from uh, the work of people who had these data and who became co-authors of that paper. One of them is this, uh, the, distribu the distribution of this crustacean in a river in uh, Guadeloupe. Uh, I told you yesterday that Guadeloupe is two, actually two islands. This is where the volcano is, La Souffrière. And uh, it, there are steep rivers along the flanks of the volcano. And here, our colleague Dominique Monti from the Université des Antilles de la Guyane collected these data in a small segment of the river uh, using electric fishing. And you can look at this example, blah, 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 and so on, how the, net, the network was uh, constructed, and how it was analyzed, and how <coughs> the results compare between uh, well, it was then PTNMs here uh, that we used. Uh, PTNMs was for ge geographic distances among the points, uh, including the distance. 
MEM here was for simply for connections, presence or, or absence, but not the geography as here. And this is the AEM uh, model. And here we have the variation partitioning showing how these various explanations are redundant or not. This one and that one, that is this and that, are very redundant. But the AEM explains a portion that the uh, MEM models do not explain in that case. There are two other examples, uh, one for uh, bacterial production in a fluvial lake, and the, the third one is for the distribution of different uh, larval form of uh, zooplankton species, Calanus filmarchicus, along the coast of Newfoundland, using uh, <coughs> a uh, hydrodynamic model that had been built by physical oceanographers as the, for the structure of the network. So these three examples may be of interest to you. And all that was published in this second paper. Uh, let's see, where is it? No, not that one. Uh, anyway, a second paper published, I think, in 2010. Yeah. This slide simply shows that for a time series that represents a directional process, of course, then we can use the AEM to model a time series. And, but the structure of the AEM, uh, of the E metrics, is very simple. Because <coughs> uh, from the origin here, uh, time one is represented only by the first edge here, by E0. Time two is represented by this and that. Time three is represented by this, that, and that, and so on. As you go on along the time series, you have more and more edges that uh, intervene. And this particular uh, that, uh, E matrix produces four AEM modeling positive temporal correlation and five modeling negative temporal correlation, uh, nine altogether for 10 points. So this gives you the idea that we can apply that to model directional processes. And in AEM analysis, we don't detrend. Because if we detrend, we lose everything. So we don't want, again, to throw away the baby with the water of the bat. So we don't the trend, because the trend is what we want to model with these directional processes. And there will be more, there is more of that in this uh, document, uh, the, in this paper, where I uh, described this paper yesterday, where we use the Chesapeake Bay Benthic Monitoring Program data. And you will be able to play with that this afternoon. And here we use uh, <coughs> MEM and AEM to model the temporal structure in addition to the spatial sp space-time analysis that we also do. So this afternoon, I will uh, <coughs> let you play with all that. Uh, and, but there is a word of warning that comes, uh, that comes here. This is about the software. So in the new ADE spatial package, we have this DBMEM function, the forward cell function, uh, scalogram, and so on, the MEM function for generalized MEM, and so on. But then function DBMEM here replaces the function PCNM that we had before. I took the, uh, the function PCNM and adapted it to the code, uh, to the code already in existence in ADE spatial to produce this function. And in, to make it to make sure that it computed the MEM, the DBMEMs correctly. So in the practicals of the Chesapeake Bay, the calculations were still done with the PCNM function. That paper was published in, 19, in 2014. The work was done 2013. Uh, this DBMEM function, I wrote it in last May. So of course, it did not exist at the time. When you see the script of the practicals, when it calls the PCNM in capital function, please remember that this function does no, is no longer available, and it is replaced by that one. The way to pass the parameters are, I think they are the same. But you will have to uh, make sure that you do it correctly with this new function. OK, I'll stop there, and we can have coffee and uh, start again at 11, okay?